Hello and welcome to GCV Analytics uh, webinar. Today we're going to be talking about the industrial sector and I am really excited because uh, we are going to be hosting a panel of three guest speakers today. So I am truly delighted to uh, to have here uh, along with me, well at least uh, online, uh, Dr. Bernhard Moore, uh, Managing uh, Director of Corporate Venturing at Evonik Venture Capital, Michael Young, um, Director of Caterpillar Ventures, and uh, Dr. Tina Tosukawang, uh, Head of Innovation and uh, Business Development at GC Ventures uh, America. So. Um, welcome, guys, and uh, thank you so much for um, for joining us for this uh, webinar and this sort of online panel in uh, in such turbulent uh, such turbulent times. I really appreciate it, and uh, and of course our founder and editor in chief uh, uh, Jim Mawson um, as well. Along yeah, with us here. Yeah, delighted to be here. Thanks, Kellyanne. Really appreciate everything you've done to set this up, and honoured to be um, among such fine experts. Thank you. All right. Um, so we are going to do a discussion panel as um, as we have promised. But before that, to set uh, a, to set the contextual framework for the industrial sector, I'm going to go over as quickly as I can over um, over some of the data we uh, we have managed to gather on the industrial sector based on the latest report um, that I wrote. So let's get let's get right into it. Um, one sec. So, um, the way we define the industrial sector uh, at GCV is uh, is rather broad, and it encompasses things from things like ma manufacturing equipment and advanced materials, as well as chemicals, also things like 3D printing, robotics, and um, and drones, uh, space and satellite, even agriculture and ag tech, among many many other things. And uh, whenever we speak about the industrial sector. Um, we have to keep in mind some some of the general trends that we've seen we've seen in the sector in the past uh, uh, five years or even in the past decade, um, and we cannot but uh, think of uh, some of the buzzwords that of uh, that we've seen uh, in the media. Some some buzzwords like Industry 4.0, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and um, you know they're they're great for headlines and they're good to describe an overall direction. Um, that the, the sector has been moving into, um, but it hasn't been, you know, necessarily a, a pleasure cruise. There have been, uh, you know, a few setbacks and retreats of some of uh, some some of the major major players uh, in the sector. So um, a year ago, we saw GE Ventures dismantle its unit, and uh, just recently, Dupont Ventures has announced that uh, it will. Um, it will uh, shut down its uh, its corporate venture unit as well. So um, it's important to keep to keep this uh, to keep this in mind. In terms of the important uh, verticals and horizontals and uh, overall uh, trendy uh, trendy kind of uh, technology. So probably the first one, the most obvious one when it comes to industrials is 3D printing. And even though it has failed uh, to an extent, I'd say, uh, has failed to um, to turn homes into um, factories as someone would have predicted 10 years ago or uh, five years ago, um, it's still a very important technology with great potential um, because it has, uh, it, it, we, we see clearly there is a drive to employ metals, alloys, and other materials, even though it's mostly running with polymers right now. Uh, however, the potential uh, looking forward is really, uh, really huge there. Um, same could be said about drones or um, unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, the global market for drones uh, is estimated uh, to be a 6.8 billion and ex is expected to um, to multiply several times uh, by 2022. Well, this uh, prediction obviously is uh, pre-coronavirus, so we would have to revise the numbers a bit there. But um, interesting thing is, like this, this sort of prediction excludes military drones, which is which is a big a big chunk of it. So it includes consumer drones and industrial industrial drones, and you know, for consumer drones. Um, we could we could really if we want to be black and white about it we could really say that it's little more than a than a fun toy but um, you know a, 
using drones in industry is something extremely, extremely valuable and uh, brings enormous efficiencies across various, various industries. So um, it, it is, it continues to be something really to watch for. And then of course we have robots and, and automation, um, which are also forecast to, um, to exhibit double digit growth uh, in the near or medium term, um, largely driven by um, the obvious things like cost reduction, uh, improving quality, and uh, improving health and safety conditions of, of the workplace. Um, I know Michael and Caterpillar has been involved in that space, so um, later on in the discussion panel, hopefully he will touch uh, he will touch more on that. Um, uh, like I mentioned, in the industrial sector, we also include agriculture because of the uh, heavy uh, chemical and mechanized element of how agriculture is done in, in the modern world today. Um, so we, we, we've witnessed the, the rise of precision farming, uh, where you marry uh, digital technology and uh, traditional uh, agricultural activities. And uh, um, long, the longer term, from a longer term perspective, uh, it's, uh, it, it is forecasted to grow, to grow significantly. And this is driven by um, largely by um, reality, by just demographic underlying demographic realities. Uh, uh, as it's estimated uh, that global farming production will have to increase 70% by by the mid-century in order to um, to meet uh, to meet any sort of demand uh, for for food. Um, in order to keep uh, to keep the world's population uh, fed, um, and um, in terms of other verticals, space and satellite tech, we've seen very interesting developments where the um, number of operational satellites in orbit uh, has never been bigger before, and it's never been uh, cheaper and easier to produce and launch a satellite as in the last decade. So um, this is obvious. This obviously has huge implications in terms of. Uh, the ever more connected world we live in. Um, uh, in terms of the chemical industry, uh, it has been um, it has been facing a set of challenges, both on the demand and on the supply side. On the demand side, um, its uh, its users are in this sometimes the vast bulk of it. Uh, bulk of them are industries uh, that are slightly cyclical, like construction and automotive. Um, and on the supply side. Uh, well, some of the inputs are also also coming from the oil and gas sector and from other commodities. So um, it's not exactly a recipe for a smooth sailing. And uh, hopefully, both Tina and uh, and Bernhard will will touch on that and what are, what were the kind of uh, the kind of challenges they have been facing in in their industry and how how innovation. Uh, that makes operations uh, more efficient uh, has hopefully been a been a godsend for them. And um, finally, in terms of advanced materials, um, we have uh, we have a lot of forecasts that uh, the uh, the industry will grow, um, and that's driven mostly by the ongoing industrialization of emerging emerging economies and increased consumption of consumer goods in the uh, already developed developed economies. Um, so uh, as you can see from from this whole overview, um, that there, there's been there there have been a lot of forces uh, that drive venture investing uh, in the industrial sector and there have been a lot of um, a lot of interesting horizontals and verticals um, where interesting tech solutions have uh, have been uh, have been found and uh, have been explored. Um, and just to illustrate that further, on, on the next slide that I've, uh, that I've prepared, uh, it illustrates some of the co-investment patterns of industrial corporates here that we saw last year in particular. So it's a it's a it's a really diverse array of, of technology. So we we see things like uh, mobility, like Gojek or applied parking. Um, through things like energy storage, like ESS or Hydrogenius, um, AI solutions for the workplace, like SkyDisk or um, even electric uh, circuit tech, like uh, like Cellink, and, and so on and so on and so forth. So uh, there has been indeed a lot of investing in, in very very diverse fields, um, and indeed if we look at the data for investing. 
um, we see clearly that over the second half of last decade, uh, there was, was clearly an upward trend in the number of deals done by industrial corporates. On a year-on-year -year basis, uh, 2019 versus 2018, we see that the number of deals did register a significant increase here, 272 through 333. The, um, the amount of capital, uh, the amount of total capital in the uh, in the in the in the uh, in these rounds uh, remained somewhat somewhat flat, uh, I I should say. Um, so that that does suggest that some of the some of the valuations of those deals industrials have been doing uh, may have either remained flat or not may not have grown uh, you know as fast as as they as they had. Uh, previous year, so hopefully we'll touch on that during the discussion panel. Um, it's a similar it's a similar story in uh, if, if we just uh, take a look at the um, the industrial startups. So uh, we see a number of industrial startups being funded by corporates has uh, has grown tremendously. Um, even in terms of the deal numbers year on year, they did grow from 2018 to 2019. However, the dollars, uh, the total dollars in those rounds uh, did register uh, a bit of a significant drop. Uh, so that does suggest there might be something going on with, with the valuations. I'm hoping to find out, um, find out uh, more about it from our panel. Um, and, uh, on this slide, I prepared, uh, well, it's just the top deals done by industrial corporates. I'm not going to go into too much uh, detail about, about each one, as uh, everyone could, could read that on, on our webpage or in our latest issue. I, I just want to, want to emphasize one thing, that uh, some of these top deals were not necessarily all concentrated in, in industrial. Uh, they, were, they were spread across, uh, across different sectors. And I believe the reason for that is uh, is simply the um, maturity and time horizon of uh, of industrial investments. As uh, an industrial startup takes uh, much longer to to mature and to become exitable or profitable um, than um, than say a software development company. So uh, that probably has to do with that um, among among other things, of course. Um, in terms of the exits, we didn't see we didn't see that much uh, much difference uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. As you can see, about the same number of exits in both 2018 and 2019. And the total estimated dollars in those exits were largely and broadly the same. Um, and uh, finally, in terms of the industrial funding initiatives that we that we track, uh, we did see them grow in number. However, that was largely because of a uh, growing number um, of more accelerators focused on uh, industrial and industrially related uh, um, startups, uh, not so much uh, any of the other categories, really. Um, and uh, in terms of the total dollars in those initiatives, we didn't see much difference. In fact, we saw uh, a bit of a, a bit of a drop in uh, in total dollars last year. So, um, but we are yet to see what's going to happen uh, post coronavirus uh, this year, of course. And uh, with that, I'm 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 going to give the word briefly to uh, Jim, who would uh, like to say a few words about our organization and uh, also about uh, our events. Yeah, thanks very much, Kalyan. And uh, obviously, we live in uh, interesting times, as some people would say. And um, but just to give you a little bit of context about the work that's obviously been doing from a GCD analytics report in, in terms of the industrial sector, that's just one of the 10 sectors that we cover across. We look at the different regions as well and trying to get a better sense of who does what. So which corporations do what deals? How do they support VCs as limited partners? And how are they generally trying to bring that external innovation back into the, the corporation to help the parent, which is probably more pertinent and relevant than ever given the, the sort of latest coronavirus challenge on cash flows and supply and demand issues. So Global Corporate Venturing um, is just one of the publications we do. We do another one around Global University Venturing and one 
on global impact venturing, the global university venturing one covers the student and faculty spin outs and startups and global impact venturing particularly helps governments understand the sort of sustainable development goals how the sort of next generation of uh, of uh, of well medical cures or sort of poverty relief or other measures that might make the world a better place come through and the gcv connect platform allows uh, corporate members to connect with their peers and hopefully help their portfolio companies with their five specific needs of capital customers product development hiring and an exit and as you mentioned Kellyanne uh, about the events obviously as well as doing the sort of data and news and uh, and uh, and sort of publications in the connect platform to help people understand what's going on we also bring people together and uh, we're coming off the back of our GCVI summit which was our largest and most successful yeah with about 800 plus attendees and 10 trillion dollars of aggregate annual revenue from the corporations who attended we've been preparing for our gcv symposium in london which would have been our 10th uh, event uh, on the 3rd and 4th and june but given this uh, coronavirus and the sort of recommendations from uh, parliament where we were due to hold uh, part of the program uh, for the powerless dinner we've actually will likely push back the in real life or the person event uh, to the second half of the year, probably around October time, and then do a digital forum um, to to enable people to sort of benefit from from the sort of sharing and networking. So we've been we'll be announcing more next week in terms of what that digital forum will look like. But effectively, it will take some of the sort of advantages of the Connect platform of how people can swap their portfolio companies and engage with other corporations in a virtual environment and enable also some of the sort of content such as these types of webinars and exchange of information to also come through so i'm actually super excited in in its quirky way we're trying to follow the leadership of people like bernard tina and michael in terms of how they think about their portfolio and supporting corporations and apply some of those uh, some of those best practices ourselves as a small company so what we're trying to do is use the coronavirus as very much an opportunity to go from a fixed mindset of how do we approach events and how do we help people to a growth mindset around how do we enable new and better hopefully more uh, exciting collaborations and initiatives to be done so so but then we're still expecting for the fall or for the autumn uh, our new york and brazil and and uh, houston events to 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 come together and and actually uh, i won't reveal too much but we're preparing quite an exciting little program in california as well towards the end of august so uh so keep uh, keep keep uh, keep aware for for that that will be quite an exciting uh, quite an exciting little initiative actually which uh, won't come as a surprise to some people but uh, but actually will be uh, we're really i'm really looking forward to that actually uh, so but anyway kalyan back to you and uh, be very keen to hear more about uh, this sort of discussion with uh, with such experts Thank you, uh, thank you, Jim. Um, I'm looking for. I'm looking forward to the discussion panel. So let's uh, let's get it started without without further ado. Really, um, we have prepared a few slides for for each of the speakers. So before we start the discussion and before I start leading with questions, uh, I would ask um, each of you each of you to uh, take about uh, a minute to introduce yourselves, uh, use the slide that, that we have prepared and uh, talk about the investment thesis of your unit. And uh, before that, I would also like to remind uh, people in the audience watching this, uh, watching this live, there's about 50, 52 attendees right now. Um, so I would like to uh, remind them that uh, they could uh, send their questions uh, on the um, right hand side panel which should appear on their screen there must be a section called questions so feel free to submit your questions and uh, me uh, me and uh, and the rest of the panelists here will try to uh, address uh, address them at the end of uh, at the end of our our discussion um, so feel free to do that please and uh, let's uh, so let's start with uh, with the introductions first uh, Ben Hart. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Carlo, and, and, and good morning, good afternoon to, to everyone. Uh, a great pleasure to, uh, to be here today and, 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 and discuss with you. 
Uh, Evonik Venture Capital, our parent company, Evonik is a Germany-based uh, specialty chemicals company. Uh, to give you uh, um, a, a flavor of, of the size of our company, uh, last year we posted sales of about 15 billion euros and, and have around about 33,000 uh, employees globally. Um, our venture capital operations were funded uh, founded in 2012. We are now investing out of our second fund and we have a total investment volume of 250 million euros. Uh, uh, we do direct investments, we do also fund investments. At this point in time, uh, we have some 30 investments globally. Uh, we run uh, three offices, uh, two, four offices, uh, um, if I count two offices in Germany, one office uh, in, in the US, in, in Persephone, New Jersey. And in 2018, we also opened up uh, our first office in Asia and are now running our operations uh, in, in Asia out of Shanghai uh, in, in, in China. Uh, areas of investment focus, as also listed here on, 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 on the slide, uh, health and care, smart materials, animal nutrition and uh, specialty additives. Um, as, as you can see here, uh, we are predominantly investing in early stage companies, uh, typically series A and B, but with the second fund, uh, we, we also broadened our mandate uh, to now also invest in, in, in later stage companies. And also with the second fund, uh, we have an increased emphasis on, on digital opportunities. Right, thank so, you, uh, Bernhard. Thank you, Bernhard. Um, up next, Michael uh, and Caterpillar Ventures. Thank you very much, uh, and certainly glad to be here. Uh, you know, Caterpillar certainly, it, I would say, invests what I would say close to home. You know, we have three major segments. You know, our construction equipment, resource industries, which is really you know all around mining and quarries, and then energy and transportation, which includes you know, gas turbines, locomotives, and, and other electric power, oil and gas, and marine engines. Uh, we also invest, you know, uh, into venture funds that provide us insight and geographic, ex, you know, expansion. I would say in general, you know, uh, we also look at, you know, very specific uh, technologies you know, where whether it's energy slash electrification, which includes things like energy storage, electric motors, and other opportunities in that space, you know, digital from getting information off machines all the way to providing that back to our customers, uh, ro robotics and automation, and which, in, which includes a heavy emphasis on autonomy. Uh, you know, Caterpillar has been a leader and in, in operates autonomous fleets today, and continues to look for opportunities to expand that. And then certainly on product development, whether it's you know new opportunities or new technologies like solid state batteries or 3D printing, you know, or even industrial water processing, you know, we look for opportunities to better serve our customers in the future. Thank you, Michael. And uh, finally, Tina. Um, who uh, who is I think uh, the newest on the playground kind of uh, in a kind of situation as, uh, as uh, her unit has been uh, has been around for three years but they've been doing direct investing for about a year now only so uh, Tina delighted to to have you here um, please introduce yourself and uh, the unit. Thank you, Kellyanne. Uh, GC Ventures America is a CBC arm of PTT Global Chemicals. We are a $15 billion petrochemical company headquartered in Thailand. Um, GC is a flagship material producer of PTT Group that you might know uh, is a national oil and gas company of Thailand. So our typical operations uh, consist of the upstream refinery. We process something like 280,000 barrel of crude oil a day. We produce over 10 million metric ton per year of chemicals, polymers, and intermediates. 
and we are looking into investing in startups in the areas of advanced materials, biotech life science, clean tech, and the digital platform. So in the next slides are some of the areas that uh, we are investing in. And in all of the areas we are uh, investing in, we are putting a lot of focus in terms of finding the way to um, doing the collaboration with all of the portfolios company. And as uh, Kalyan mentioned, we've been around for uh, three years. And uh, the first year was strictly uh, doing collaboration. And once we got our venture set up, uh, we started to invest um, into the venture funds. So the next slide, um, you'll see that um, there are three funds that we have uh, invested in and partnered with uh, so far. We have Pangea funds in Vancouver, uh, Emerald in Switzerland, and Builders uh, digital funds in San Francisco area. And they are our trusted partner, finding the quality deal flow. And uh, we are very uh, happy uh, to go together with them and co-invest in various opportunities. And in terms of the investment itself, uh, we focus on the later stage company from Series A onward. Um, and so far, we have made um, three direct investment in medical device, in 3D printing, and in the um, energy storage company. So um, we are we don't always uh, lead the round, but uh, mostly we are looking for co-investment and syndicate with other VC and CVC. Right, uh, great. Thank you, uh, thank you, Tina. Um, so let's uh, let's start the discussion uh, here with uh, some of the questions that I've prepared. Now, um, I am conscious everyone is keen uh, keen to talk about and to hear about uh, the coronavirus. But uh, before we do that, um, just looking back at, at last year, um, what have been the most interesting trends uh, that you guys have seen in the um, some of the particular areas you invest in. So um, perhaps automation, um, if, if Michael could touch something on automation and then uh, Bernhard and Tina in terms of uh, things like uh, chemistry, advanced materials and, and life sciences. Um, so Michael? You know, I, I would say, you know, there's some, I, I don't want to call them recycled, but things that circle back around. And last year, uh, I think drones, there was a reemergence. I mean, I think that was one of the things that you had talked about, you know, in your introduction. And, mm -hmm. you know, while there was a lot of investment in drones in 2015, 2016, that as you kind of mentioned, didn't live up to the hype, you know, the survivors are starting to emerge and we're starting to see, you know, more and more applications, more and more people using those. And so I would say that, you know, the, and and I even hate to use the word drone, but the data capture and monetization of 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 information is starting to to catch hold. And drone is certainly still a, a very strong acquirer of of data on on many of our platforms, right? Whether it's construction or mine site or you know through the utilities. The the other yeah. one that is is energy. I mean, energy storage is you know obviously you know lithium killed off uh, so many different good chemistries just because of the sheer volume and cost. But you're starting to see a number of those circle back around. Uh, renewed interest in in hydrogen as a fuel, and so I would say last year was you know the re the recovery of, of a couple of you know technologies that we had seen and i would even throw maybe even 3d printing but i'm hoping 3d printing is more a 2020 story in terms of a, a rebound or a recovery so mm -hmm. i'll let the other nice. panelists comment as well yeah. all right uh perhaps tina if you could um chime in on uh, on the um, chemistry sector and uh, the other areas that you invest in yes um I'd like to uh, also mention that uh, clean tech was really hot last year. We've seen this sector was so hot back in 2008, 2009 with a lot of stimulus and subsidies out there, but they got completely wiped out for a long time. And um, last year we've seen clean tech renaissance 
And I think this is totally driven by the mega trend. We've seen the world's temperature continue to rise. It doesn't stop when the subsidies stop. So um, I agree the long duration uh, energy storage for the grid scale applications. Uh, last year was a hot year for that. And we've seen a lot of consumer awareness in terms of the sustainability and the end of life of the materials the public awareness on the um, plastic waste issue was a big deal. So we've seen a lot of quality deal flows in terms of the recycling technologies, in terms of new material that would be biodegradable, that would be um, that would have a better end of life profiles, and that um, carry over into the advanced material area. I, I agree that uh, 3D printing uh, is something that uh, continue. We've seen a lot of deal flow uh, coming out of that. And um, we've seen a lot of uh, energy in terms of designing high performance materials to enable light weighting of the vehicle materials to improve the display. Um, we've seen the needs for uh, new coding material for electronics, for example, because I think the, the automotive companies, they are becoming more and more of a hardware and software company. So how do we provide a new material that would be waterproof, that would not um, attenuate the signal, that could handle the 5G communications? Those are a lot of the new material that needs to be developed. And those are the area that we are very excited about. I see. And uh, Bernhardt, um, how about from Evonik's perspective, what have been the most interesting trends yeah, um, as, 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 as uh, we showed before, we are active in, in, in four verticals and, and we are doing, see, we see a, a lot of uh, development in, in, in all these verticals and um, they are new materials uh, in all these verticals, but also what we see is really a lot going on in, in, in the digital space. I think uh, two or three years ago when we talked digital in the material environment, this was essentially in, in, in maintenance and production. So this was, but then also if you break it down, really automatization. And now we see uh, digital opportunities all over the place. And, and I will give you one example also uh, following up on what you said on, on EgTech. Evonik is uh, one of the largest, if not the largest producer of uh, animal uh, food, uh, amino acids, mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is something we felt very successfully. But now EgTech also has moved to what we call egg animal tech. So precision farming also now takes place uh, in the barn. This is precision livestock farming. And now farmers also use a lot of uh, artificial intelligence uh, in, in, in remote control of their barns and, and to support growth of their animals. Uh, be it pigs, uh, be, be it swine. And, and this, of course, is also very relevant for our business expansion. This helps us to understand our customer needs. So a lot of digital uh, opportunity is also taking place in, in the material space. Um, we have done seven investments last year and uh, about uh, half of the investments we have done and, and about 25% of the deal flow we are seeing is now in the digital space. So um, a strong move from, from purely uh, material application, material uh, um, investments in, 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 into digital. And, and these are uh, innovations in the digital space that help us to, to make our materials better, but also a lot of emphasis nowadays uh, in, in, in digital business models. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, fascinating, which actually um, dovetails really nicely to um, the second question that I'd like to ask uh, each and every one of you, how are those trends um, helping your corporate parents uh, face and solve challenges in their in their operations, not only in terms of uh, current events, but also in, in the sense of uh, that industrials, uh, indu industrial companies are very uh, um, capex intensive. Uh, so, uh, what are some of the efficiency effects uh, or efficiencies that you you guys uh, have managed to uh, to bring in um, into into the organization or hope to bring in with uh, with the innovation you invest in? 
Um, so first probably um, Bernhardt and then uh, Tina and then Michael. Yeah, I, 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 the connection just broke off. So um, I, I, I think, uh, Kalorian, if if, uh, if I understood you uh, right, the last question is how, how is it helping to solve uh, uh, these issues? Um, Maybe I want to address this a bit more generally. Um, I think when we talk about investing, um, we are a strategic investor. So the very purpose that we do invest uh, in startup companies is uh, not a financial rationale. It is a strategic rationale. So right. we, seek, we, we seek a very active cooperation uh, with our portfolio companies beyond the financial return we also do, do expect. So typically, uh, when we uh, when we do an investment, at the same time we make sure that there's also a cooperation between a business and and a startup. And of course, especially in the digital space, uh, these startup companies are typically front runners. Um, they might have uh, limited experience when it comes to the market, but they are the great experts when it comes to to new technologies and new business models. So this this really helps us to connect uh, our business experts with all their domain knowledge, with all their market expertise, with emerging uh, technologies. So really broadening and, and bringing together uh, digital insight, digital know-how uh, with a longstanding market expertise and ability also for, to, to penetrate markets and existing contacts in the market. So this is very important for us uh, to, to make sure that uh, it's not only some some orphan type of investment in in, in a great technology, but but no no link. Uh, but having this this position and and the ability to also use a startup technology uh, directly and deploy our knowledge and create this win-win situation. I see, um, Tina. Yes, um, I want to echo the sentiment that Bernhard has shared that. Um, a lot of the technology that we have acquired, um, it has uh, it has the uh, strategic intent that uh, would benefit to our corporations in the um, advanced uh, digital technologies like sensor for remote location and machine learnings. Um, this has attracted a lot of attention from our operation teams. As you can imagine, in the petrochemical plant, um, this is a business that we rely on them to run 24-7. So the fundamental problems, such as detecting a problem that could occur, predictive maintenance that reduce our downtime, energy storage that would reduce the upset in the operation, those have the impact on improving our efficiency, reducing our downtime. But more important uh, than just you know what you've seen in terms of the day-to-day -day operations, I have to say that there's a benefit of um, bringing in new technology trends as we learn from operating the CVC unit in the past couple of years. Um, we've seen that the investment um, that we've made in hard tech, um, this is uh, a potentially a new growth platform for our new business. And uh, our CVC unit is reporting uh, to the new business organization of PTTGC. So we look at CVC as a tool that um, can help a corporate make a small bet to get insight uh, in the emerging market before they actually sign a multi-million dollar check um, to acquire um, a much bigger company. So it's in a way, um, it improves the efficiency when we want to invest uh, into building a new business out of it. Right, right. And uh, Michael? You know, I, I would say in general, you know, our investments are more focused on our customer problems, but there are two specific ones that we've we've highlighted. One is ClearPath Robotics that, you know, we've been able to use their technologies internally at our logistics warehouses and use their autonomous robots to uh, be more efficient in the lower, you know, overall labor cost. The other one is, is Sarcos, you know, the company that makes the exoskeletons you know, again, while we look at this potentially as, as being a reseller of that product, we've also been an early adopter and a pilot site for Sarcos in, in terms of using their exoskeletons uh, in our factories to become more safe, you know, uh, 
safer and more efficient. Uh, you know, so I, I think in, in general, you know, we certainly do try to bring in innovation, whether we invest or not, but uh, more directly, you know, I would say most of our investments relate directly to our customers. Right. And some of the right. problems we're trying to solve with them. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, and I, as I did mention in my in my introduction, uh, it, it it would seem from our data as if uh, valuations uh, in the areas industrials in general, not U3 uh, in particular, but industrial corporates in general um, invest in. It seems like those valuations have either remained kind of flat or they're more on a on a sort of a downward trend. So um, so given given the impact of COVID-19, um, I, I guess if that's already a trend, it might continue. But what are your your observations on that? Um, perhaps Tina first. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Very timely question. I've seen very high valuations in early stage startups for the past two years, especially in biotech life science and in the digital areas and we've been watching the impact on valuation quite closely given the uh, given the COVID situation um, but based on uh, conversation uh, with my peers right now I think we're still in a very early phase of this and I haven't seen the um, valuation impact uh, trickling down in the deal that's going to close in the next three months uh, just yet. But mm -hmm. uh, my gut feeling is that, um, you know, the second half of the year, we're going to see a lot of impact because, um, first of all, I think the consumer behavior could have changed drastically during this time. People cannot get out. People have to change the way they, um, they are buying and purchasing. So that could impact the revenue. And I think second of all, um, we cannot travel and a lot of deals in hard tech. Uh, it relies on us um, being, uh, having a face-to-face -face meeting with the portfolio companies and um, doing the due diligence. So if we cannot travel, the velocity of the um, deal closing in the second half of the year is gonna be impacted. And right. um, I think we're gonna have to rely a lot on the syndicate who's local to the startup to help help share information, and maybe finally, I think the availability of the capital uh, in the second half of the year will probably uh, need to be monitored closely. A lot of folks still have a lot of dry powder uh, to execute the deal uh, at this point in time, but later uh, half of the year, maybe they would uh, start looking at. Uh, the cash management of their portfolio companies look inward more than outward. Or, um, you know, if uh, for the new investment, they may prioritize on the company that's uh, near commercial rather than the company that's going to need 24 months of runway and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So um, all in all, I think um, probably the second half of the year, uh, we'll see a lot more valuation impact, but hopefully not as abrupt as what we've seen in the public market. Right, right. Um, hopefully, hopefully not. Uh, although, um, you know, a downward correction might, um, you know, just based on uh, on the on the idea of uh, there is a silver lining in, in every cloud, um, there might be good opportunities for you for you guys to buy and invest uh, at a cheaper at a cheaper price than this time. So. You know, just just uh, just amusing of mine. But Bernhard, uh, what are your impressions on on valuations? Yeah, I, I think there is a, the adjustment in in valuation is just necessary. So if 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 we look on on on, on the public and private markets, we see that uh, they are down, uh, let's say, thirty percent on on average. And and of course, this has an immediate impact also on on exit valuations, and I would expect that also exit valuations, uh, you have shown uh, the number uh, coming down. I also expect that, that exit valuations will be down uh, by your order of magnitude of probably 30%. So this is also what, what, what I expect uh, what will happen on short midterm, that uh, entry valuations uh, will uh, see the same type of corrections and uh, when we discuss in the team, when we look at term sheets, this is the general advice uh, uh, 
uh, given to, to, to all the people in our team. Uh, um, this is uh, probably one or down. Uh, is, 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 is a proper valuation at this point in time. And, and what we can already uh, clearly see uh, for a long time, uh, the market was, was, was very friendly to, uh, to startup companies. Uh, there is shift now uh, already taking place to, uh, uh, to conditions and valuations that are more investor friendly. Um, I, I think what is important is uh, this is now also an opportunity for reliable investors. Uh, good corporates can uh, can clearly show uh, to their portfolio companies, but also to their uh, current or potential co-investors that they are reliable and, and, and continue to support uh, their portfolio companies also in, in critical situations. And, 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 and the final point um, I, I wish to make, um, uh, probably none of us can say how long this crisis uh, will take. Uh, um, yeah. But also a crisis always gives uh, its opportunity. There are plenty of opportunities out there for, for, for brave investors, uh, uh, which can uh, do some, some, some good I, I, I initial or follow on investments in course of the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. And Michael, what's your impression uh, on valuations and uh, the, the overall trend for valuations in, in the spaces you, you invest in? Yeah, no, I, I think in the short run, right, we've certainly been advising all of our companies to be very prudent with their cash. You know, we don't know, as, as both Tina and Barnhart said, you know, how long this is going to last. And there's no doubt that there's going to be an impact on valuations. Uh, to the negative, the, again, the, just like the virus, we don't know how long that will last. I mean, will there truly be an opportunity in the second half of the year? We, we, we shall see. But, you know, currently, you know, if you're getting a term sheet today, tomorrow, in two weeks, there's certainly a haircut that is, is you know, being applied to it for the uncertainty of the situation. Right, right. And um, since all of you already touched on uh, the challenges, some of the challenges that portfolio companies may face with the ongoing health crisis. Uh, um, I, I would ask you to comment uh, a bit more, a bit more on them, um, on, you know, the idea of cash crunch, uh, disrupted supply chains, and how you as corporate investors are uniquely positioned, uh, positioned to help. Uh, so Michael's already kind of touched on that. So perhaps, uh, Again, uh, Tina and Bernhardt. Yes, um, for uh, GC Ventures America, um, we are uh, located in Southeast Asia regions. And for us, um, naturally, uh, we are the market channel partner and um, manufacturing partner for uh, our portfolio company that they can rely on. In general, um, when you have the company that has a supply chain all located in the U.S., when go when U.S. go down, then that's the problem that uh, we'll face in terms of the uh, supply chain disruption. So the idea that we share with all of our portfolio company is that uh, you would need to develop a supply chain logistics, have one in Asia, have one in the U.S., so that when Asia goes down, you have a second source. When U.S. go down, you can have the second source from Asia, and not to mention, um, we we are willing to support the portfolio company find a customer in our region, uh, bringing in revenue, helping them bring in revenue uh, as quickly as we can. Mm -hmm. And then what? Yeah, I, I would say we need to be careful. I, I don't think there is. Uh, a any answer that fits all, it really depends on the business. When we talk purely about materials company, um, of, of course, uh, what Tina said, I, I think that there, there is an implication and, and, and if you serve the automotive industry, there's an even stronger uh, implication. However, what I just mentioned, uh, we have now a couple of for, of for the company. Seems like the connection broke off, uh, broke off slightly. Benhat, can you can you hear us? Um, 
You know, I, I, I just take a quick, you know, I mean, as I think Bernhard sure. was, was mentioning is that each company is different, right? I mean, some companies are experiencing, you know, customer attrition. Some of them are experiencing supply chain disruptions. Some of them were right in the middle of a process or a, a fundraising closing. So I think at the end, we need to be good investors, right? And support the company mm -hmm. that you know, deserve it, right? I mean, you, you're still going to have to make some tough decisions going through these times like we, we all do. I mean, just like we do in our normal business, right? We need to be good right. investors and good partners and do what we can to step in and help with whether that's with, you know, securing new customers or helping with a supply chain issue or, you know, with additional funding, if, if that's what it's called for. I, I, I you know, I think that's true of whether you know, you're a corporate investor today, maybe we have a little bit more opportunity to help and we're certainly you know, talking to each one and communicating with each one of our portfolio companies in order to, to, to do what we can, right? Right, right. And um, since, uh, so, since we are talking about um, investments and uh, some of you already mentioned how many investments you made last year and so on. I'd really like to um, ask you guys and to um, give you the opportunity to tell us perhaps about uh, about a recent investment that you've made that you were excited about, um, you know, with the COVID-19 issue in, in view or without it. So I, I'd really um, like to hear from you um, what you would you would like to um, share with, uh, with with the audience here. Um, so perhaps um, starting with Bernhardt, if uh, he's still on the line. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm still on the line. Can you hear me? I, I think there was yeah. just some some some, or some 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 interruption. Yeah, as I said, uh, I'm at uh, at this point in time with my team. We are very excited about. Uh, uh, any opportunities in, in in the digital space and 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 and, and using uh, using uh, using data? So uh, we did uh, one investment in in the 3D printing. Well, we have done a couple of investments in the 3D printing space, uh, but most recently we did one investment in Israel. There's a company named Castor, and uh, they are collecting data and do then make recommendations. Uh, is 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 a specific part. Uh, uh, being suited uh, uh, for for three D printing, what would be the ideal process? Um, what would be the, the the ideal material? And of course, as they as they aggregate data, uh, they 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 can not not only uh, respond uh, uh, to certain requests. Is the material be printable? They can also themselves uh, make recommendations for the printability of of materials. So this this is what I mean. I, I think uh, Ivonic is. Is a large supplier of 3D printing materials. We started out uh, to invest in companies that, that do 3D printing, and, and now expanding in, in the value chain and, and also using digital solution and artificial intelligence uh, uh, to really understand the needs of our customers, but also use this to, to increase our digital footprint. So I have a couple of examples all over the place, and, and this is what we are actively seeking. Um, for essentially all the four verticals uh, I showed before. Right, and um, perhaps uh, Michael, if you could um, yeah. give uh, give a few examples from Caterpillar's portfolio. Well, you know, one of the more recent investments we made was in a company called EEG, which is a, a CO2 recovery uh, platform that captures engines, I mean, CO2 exhaust from engines and turbines, which obviously from a Caterpillar perspective is is fantastic and social responsible. But, you know, this company is actually operates in a niche in the oil and gas market. So, you, mm -hmm. you know, uh, again, we thought when we made the investment, you know, when you go back to kind of zero week last week, every, that's the only thing everybody talked about was, you know, environmentally uh, social opportunities for the oil and gas companies. And then you mm -hmm. fast forward here. And you have the coronavirus and an unprecedented right drop in oil mm -hmm. and gas prices, and yet we 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 still believe in the company, right? I mean, at the end of the day, this you know oil is going to be required for decades, you know, most likely to come. You know, we need to have this environmental impact, and in and in more importantly, we also are going to have to. Uh, 
have directives that are going to make us cost competitive and make our customers cost competitive. And so we believe, you know, the you know the investment in EEG is even more, you know, fundamental than it was when we made it. Now, is there going to be some ups and downs? Are we going to have to support this company? Are we going to have to go out and help make sure that you know we continue to bring investors in? Absolutely. But I, I, I think you know when you have when you make investments for all the right decisions, you know, not necessarily just for financial returns, that mm -hmm. you can see them through. And and I think that's just a, a great example of one that, you know, in, even in the current environment where all the, you know, cards that have been dealt to them, you know, have have, have not, you know, come up uh, what they expected, you know, we still believe long term that this is going to be a, a great investment for Caterpillar. All right. And uh, Tina, perhaps uh, an example from uh, GC uh, Ventures portfolio. Sure. Um, our most recent investment is in the uh, long duration flow battery company called ESS based in Oregon. We co-invested in Series C um, alongside the Breakthrough Energy Ventures, SoftBank Energy, BSF Venture and Pangea Ventures. And the reason why we really like um, this technology is that um, we are petrochemical companies. We have um, a subsidiary that operate the utility, generate power, generate steam. They run um, the solar farm and wind farm. But uh, while these renewable energy is great, you can't run them all the time because the sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time. So in order for us to be uh, more uh, renewable, we need a solution that would store the energy uh, from solar, from wind, and then be able to discharge them over mm. a long time. And it has to be low cost, it has to be non-toxic, which we cannot get from the existing lithium power battery. So we found the solution in ESS and we are very excited in their island flow uh, electrolyte chemistry. Um, and now they are offering products that uh, could be small scale energy warehouse, uh, 100 kilowatt or it can be designed into a, an energy center for microgrid and grid scale. And um, we, we do believe in the future of clean power. We do believe in the company's technology and we, we, we really like our syndicate um, and we believe that they will weather through this storm. And if we all believe in the mega trend that the world need to address global warming, um, we need to continue to support companies um, in this clean technology area. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, storage, energy storage technology is uh, is kind of the crucial uh, the crucial link um, between um, things like sustainable energy, um, things like solar, wind, and uh, also for even for things in the automotive like electric like electric cars, uh, you know, a, a big part of the challenge there is related to, to energy storage. And, um, you know, the, the decreasing costs of energy storage over the past uh, nearly a decade uh, is what some analysts call um, the, the major push for uh, the re-emergence of uh, renewables of things like solar, even without uh, the generous subsidies. Um, however, others um, others doubt whether you know such uh, cost reductions in lithium-based technology would be would be possible to do over again over the next decade. Um, that's that's a little doubtful. So it, it, it's great that uh, that you guys are looking for alternative alternative solutions to that, uh, not just uh, not just on you know on the grounds that uh, lithium is more contaminating than than other other sort of solutions. Um, but uh, in, enough of me rambling on this. Um, it's a fascinating topic. Um, the the very last question before we address any questions from the audience that I'd like to uh, ask you guys it's it's clear that uh, you've been working very hard to uh, bring in uh, exciting new innovation to your organizations and uh, if we look at uh, how much money has been invested over the past decade in um, in in VC rounds it's over a trillion dollars and uh, it it is 
it has served to make the world a better a better place and a more exciting place and a more efficient place as well. Um, but given the challenge that we're facing now with coronavirus or with COVID-19 and uh, the economic consequences, which uh, none of us could, could really predict, um, it's, I think it's imperative for me um, as, uh, you know, as leading this panel to, to ask you, what is the level of support you receive from your corporate parent to weather the storm and to, to go forward? I know uh, Ben Hart uh, based his uh, second fund last year, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, if my memory serves me right. And, uh, um, you know, some of you are, uh, like Tina, are, are relatively new to equity investing in a sense, uh, direct equity investing. Um, so I'd really like to uh, to hear your your perspective your perspective on this uh, rather delicate but uh, but sort of fair question, I believe. So I guess uh, Bernhardt, if we could start with you. Yeah, and 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 uh, Kaloyan, I, I think you sh you showed some very impressive examples. Uh, there there are two. Uh, I I wouldn't want to call them dinosaur, but uh, organizations like GE and and Dupont. I, I think uh, I was really shocked uh, to to when I learned that they ceased their their activities. And uh, yes, we managed to to raise our second fund that even had a higher size than our first fund, end of 2018 in a in 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 an economically different situation. So as I think what really is key uh, from the very beginning uh, to find uh, high management support for your operation and, and also teach people uh, that this is a long-term play and, and there, there, there might be crisis. Uh, I think this is not this is unavoidable, but uh, also it is important to continue support uh, portfolio companies and if any possible, uh, even do new investments in, in such a situation. Uh, and typically, corporate venture capital units are set up when the sun shines. Uh, the, the corporates have right. plenty of money to spend, but I, I think you need to prepare uh, your internal stakeholders that uh, also in difficult times uh, you you need to move on and and and, and survive uh, and and then continue and then come out of this even stronger. Uh, this this is what we have done over the past years. I, I think uh, it showed the first time. Uh, when we uh, were allowed to do the second fund, and 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 I'm very optimistic on this that uh, we can also continue in 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 a crisis uh, like the one we see at this point in time. All right, and um, Tina, uh, perhaps. And then yeah, Michael. obviously, um, we are we are still very young uh, CVC team, um, but what I've seen so far, I have nothing but you know gratitude uh, for the corporate parent during this time. And um, they stress that safety uh, of our employees definitely number one priority during this time. And in terms of the support to the CVC activities, uh, we've actually just had the IC meeting uh, this morning. So our deals in the pipeline still continue to move forward. And I, I, I echo the view that um, Bernhard has shared that um, this is a long-term game. Um, our company has been around for a long, long time. And um, this CVC investment, um, this is to get a signal in the emerging market. If anything, uh, what we can help the corporate during this time is to be eyes and ears and find a new signal, find the investment opportunities, um, and learnings from this crisis because consumer behaviors and things could change quite drastically and we learn from the CVC communities and hopefully the knowledge and the insight that we can bring back to corporate um, it will bear fruit and then it will keep us uh, in the game for the long horizon but uh, as far as I've seen um, things still continue to push through but we'll probably have to be uh, more prudent uh, than even before. And I know that this is a turbulent time uh, for everyone, but um, I, I still have a strong uh, belief and support uh, in the corporate to continue the CVC function to navigate through the situation. 
You know, from uh, from my perspective, uh, I have a, a number of comments, and many of them echo what Berhard and Tina have said. But uh, you know, I guess th that question will probably be a lot more relevant in about two months when we actually see what what happens, right? But I, I am obviously blessed to be with Caterpillar, just like you know, PTT have been around a long time and have weathered a number of storms. I mean, just since you know, I've been with Caterpillar, the 2008 downturn. You know the oil and gas and mining you know really corrupt uh, uh, recession in 2013 through 15 you know we we weathered and and to be honest we started our vc uh, initiative in the middle of a downturn so i feel mm -hmm. pretty good about our chances of surviving uh, we actually received yesterday you know approval to make uh, an additional investment that will be probably be funding you know on monday or tuesday and uh great you know, lastly I, I i absolutely agree with both of them that communication upward is going to be highly important and in fact one of the things on my to-do list is a communication to our executive office with kind of a report on where you know our portfolio stands in general and, and some specifics around each of our portfolio companies to provide them some insight. You know, uh, at this time, you know, surprises aren't things that are, you know, cherished. And so if we're gonna have some, some hits, let's make sure we get them on the table. I also think just important to get out on the table, there's some, gonna be some opportunities that are gonna arise from this to, to Caterpillar. And we also need to make sure that we're thinking about those kind of as we move forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if I'm, I'm conscious of time, and I know we're just uh, on the top of the hour and all, but um, um, I would ask if you guys could uh, stick with me for a few more minutes so we could go through um, the questions submitted by the audience. So the first one is uh, Jean-Michel Deligny asks if the people PPT will be distributed afterwards? The answer is yes, both the PPT and the recording of this webinar will be distributed uh, um, probably tomorrow sometime. Um, second question we we have is uh, what were the top three risks to your funds before the COVID crisis? And this is submitted by Daniel Sini. Um, so perhaps uh, Michael and then Tina and then Bernhardt. I'm sorry, uh, what was the question again? What were the top three risks to your funds um, before the COVID crisis? Interesting question. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, certainly, you know, adoption rates. You know, in in the industrial sector, you know, we have a number of what we think are fantastic technologies right whether it's mindsense or g2it or you know uh sarcos right and you know adoption is getting industrial companies to adopt is is always slow so that extended sales channel i, I think continues to be kind of the portfolio's you know largest challenge i would say that the second is is you know supply chain and again this was even before uh, you know the crisis but you know when you're a startup and you're trying to you know build volume you know getting uh, a share of mind of many of the large uh, let's just say suppliers especially as you look to you know Asia to, to be a supplier is, is sometimes difficult and so that obviously drives cost you know in that supply chain I'll mention those two and, and let Tina and Barhart, you know, leave some for them as well. So. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, for us, um, the typical challenges for hard tech is um, probably the technology scale of risk, um, how to uh, scale it up. And when you build things in the small flask, it's, uh, it's working. But once you put it into a big unit, it's, uh, something always goes wrong and it's always uh, a question of the uh, the team that do they have the ability to address those risks and fix it uh, where it needs to be done. Maybe the second of all, um, to bring the cost down, everyone always uh, have a projection of uh, they're gonna be able to bring the cost down three times in such a short time. Uh, 
um, can they actually do it? Uh, it's always the risk. And maybe third one, uh, I think is customer adoption. Uh, this mm -hmm. is often something that's hard to control by the company themselves. And oftentimes, hard tech is a very capital intensive. And uh, oftentimes, we have to build uh, to get the cost low and then um, find figure out if the how fast the customer can buy uh, the product. So those are quite big of a risk. Uh, in all the pitch deck we've seen, everyone has the hockey stick for the revenue, but the reality there's always going to be some mismatch. So those are always uh, something we always worried about. Mm -hmm. All right, and Bernhard? Yeah, well, uh, I, I think as, as as my colleagues have express, expressed, it's an it's an excellent way. Um, I, I maybe address it a bit differently. Um, doing this now uh, with Ivani for eight years, uh, what is the key learning for us as an investor in the material space? And 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 one of the key learnings for us as 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 a team is uh, to avoid, if any possible, uh, very capital intensive business models, and and also companies that have a very high cash burn and still some time to go uh, until uh, breaking cash flow uh, until breaking even cash flow and and i think this this shows in in any crisis that that, that really delays the time to market uh, this is uh, very difficult for any company to survive or for investors to continue support the company mm -hmm. All right, so, and on to the next question. Um, how does your investment thesis fit your strategic planning? I believe you, all three of you have uh, kind of addressed that um, and how, how much of a strategic fit uh, it, it, your, your startups are. But um, if, you, if any, of, any one of the three of you would like to uh, comment briefly, briefly on that. Yeah, let, let let me briefly take take this question up. Uh, I, I think um, if you want to benefit, and at the same time, if you want to support a, a company actively, that, that there has to be a fit. Uh, I think it will be very difficult also to help a company to grow faster and more efficiently if if, if there is no fit. So strategic mm -hmm. fit is, is is very important to 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 benefit uh, from the company. But strategic fit is also essential to us, for us, in order to be able to, to leverage uh, our corporate machine and, and help the company to grow faster. All right. Um, on, to the, on to the next question, um, which is a really interesting one, um, also from uh, Georges Tello, I guess. Uh, are you developing other initiatives besides CBC? So I, I suppose that refers to any sort of accelerators, incubators, anything, anything of the sort. Are, are you guys involved in anything like that? Or so probably open innovation initiatives, things like that. You know, I would say, you know, there's a couple. On, you know, we've certainly participated with Techstars on a couple of, of programs. So not necessarily doing it ourselves, but uh, the other thing uh, is our dealers, you know, Caterpillar is blessed with, you know, independent dealers uh, around the globe, probably without a doubt, the strongest dealer network, independent dealer network of, you know, of, of any, you know, Fortune 500 company. And uh, they recently kicked off kind of a, a, a venture slash innovation arm. And that's, we, we, you know, we actually believe that gets us closer to our customers and is a, is a huge advantage as we kind of look at deal flow together. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, on to the next question. Uh, suppose, uh, how do you develop uh, your relationship and cooperation strategy between the startup and your corporate partner? What are the key steps? Um, how do you define a successful cooperation between the startup and the uh, parent parent corporation? Um, so I guess briefly from uh, from the three of you, I guess if we could do that. Um, Tina, perhaps first. Yeah. 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 So uh, for GC Ventures. Um, in all of the deals, we have to actually um, develop sort of the post-deal collaboration programs uh, with the startup before we go to finalize the deal uh, with the investment committees. And we actually have the vice president level as a champion for this. 
and her KPI is tied to um, the execution of the collaboration partnership. So um, we definitely uh, have to have the end in mind before we go into invest in the startup that what do we want to come out of it. Uh, in some of the um, investment that we are looking at, uh, we may have a, a goal in mind that we're going to deploy the product at our corporate and it's going to result in a certain uh, dollar cost saving at a corporation. So um, I think the, the benefit and outline once it's um, spelled out from the beginning, it's very clear who's doing what and how to track those progress. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Bernhard and then Michael. Yeah, I, I, I think Tina has, has, has phrased this very nicely. We have a similar process. Uh, when there is a confirmed strategic interest, we run this in, in, in parallel. So we have the discussion uh, centering around the, the equity investment and our colleagues from the business uh, have the discussion uh, around the business corporation. Uh, what we like to do is to, to close both agreements at, at, at the same uh, time. However, what is also very important for us is to separate these two items. Um, and we want to act as a professional investor, so we are also a secretly legal entity. So it's completely on the business to, to negotiate uh, their cooperation. It is completely on us uh, to, to, to negotiate the, uh, the, the investment uh, terms, and, and, and there is no crossover in, 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 in the negotiations. All right, Michael. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, we're kind of in the middle of the two. I mean, we certainly need to have line of sight to a commercial agreement or, or a plan. We also include in our investment proposal metrics of how to measure that, you know, going forward. And, and of course, it, it's different on on for each each investment. And lastly, I would say, you know, since we do have the three segments and a number of business units that, you know, partner with us, I would say one of our best practices is, you know, our oil and gas team actually has a maximizer, as they call it, right, that that looks after all of their venture investments and kind of is the link, you know, a one-stop shop into their organization to, uh, you know, to make sure that the startups are getting kind of the proper attention. So I, I would say that those would be the key, you know, key thoughts from, from our perspective. Great. Um, on to the next question. Actually, a uh, question is to you, Michael. What was the name of the CO2 platform that you that you mentioned? The company is called EEG. EEG, and it's on our yeah, and it's on our uh, you know on the portfolio slide. And if if anybody you know wants the link to the company, I can certainly provide that to you. Okay. All right. Um, so up next is a question from Professor Martin Hemick. What about innovative startup technologies from countries like China and Russia for industrial deals that can go global? What is uh, what is everyone's take on that? I I believe Bernhard has already invested in a in a China-based fund. Um, the question is very relevant also to uh, to Tina, given uh, the geographical uh, proximity of Thailand and China, I suppose and. Uh, for Michael, I, I suppose as well, it's it's very it's a very relevant relevant question. Okay, well, uh, good good afternoon to Martin. <laughs> First of all, and and, and second thing, uh, I I can say uh, we we just uh, approved our second direct investment uh, in China with our investment committee yesterday, and uh, this 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 company has a technology. Uh, uh, that is uh, meant uh, to to be developed uh, in 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 China, but uh, certainly has has the potential for a global rollout. So uh, most of the things we do see in China have an immediate relevance for the Chinese market, which of course is a big market. Uh, but uh, most of the technologies we see in China also are uh, relevant and, and and good enough uh, to 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 seek and find global application. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tina? Yes, um, well, thank you for the question. Um, GC Ventures, we do plan to invest globally. 
and uh, my responsibility is in the um, North America execution. So um, when we see the deals in China and Russia, um, there are a few mechanisms that we could participate uh, in the in the syndicate. Um, if the entity is in um, China itself, um, our team is our Bangkok team is currently looking at the possibility of investing in the fund in China as the um, starting point to get our feet into the um, Asian uh, ecosystem. And after that uh, going on, that could open up, you know, uh, the direct investment uh, in the following years, that kind of thing. So perhaps um, our partner fund uh, could participate and then we could participate later on. And there are some uh, some of the deals that we've seen from Russia right now that the technology is coming out of Russia. Um, but the company is planning to go into U.S. market. And as a result, they are registering the U.S. corporate entity. And uh, in such a case, we, uh, my team uh, would likely be interested in, you know, participate in the U.S. entity. It's just because we are um, divided geographically. So um, overall, we are definitely uh, interested in the company um, any company anywhere in the world, but uh, when it comes to the execution, um, there are certain strategy that uh, we have set out and we'll follow, we'll follow that procedures uh, in order to participate. You know, you know, from a cat perspective, you know, I, I agree with Tina's approach. You know, we have looked at a number of funds and partners there. Uh, we, you know, China for cat is, is well, not just for cat for, Every construction equipment manufacturer is, is actually the largest market in the world. So keenly, you know, aware of the market and participate on a daily basis. We also believe from a technology perspective, energy storage and autonomy, that they are going to come up with some unique opportunities from a technology perspective. So we continue to look into China. We haven't made any, you know, investments. I would, but I, I wouldn't preclude anything. You know, from a Russia perspective, several companies that we have looked at, as Tina has kind of stated, you know, as they come to the U.S. and they get more of a, a an entity that I would say is investable, you know, starts getting a C-Corp, you know, registered in the U.S., that would probably make, you know, those opportunities a little bit more doable. Thank you, guys. I'm, I'm I'm really conscious of time. We have a couple more questions uh, questions left. Or perhaps I could take one more question. There is um, there is uh, there is someone asking how Michael could be contacted. So um, just uh, email me afterwards, and I'll I'll introduce uh, I'll introduce you to Michael over email. Um, and, and the very last question that uh, that I would like to take. Um, thank you for your patience, guys. Is uh, do you um, do you see an investment uh, as an LP in a VC fund uh, to invest in early stage startup as a way to start a CVC unit? Do you believe large corporations should start a CVC activity investing investing directly? So each of you three very briefly um, your perspective your perspective on their matters. So starting with uh, Tina and then uh, Michael and then Bernhardt. Yeah, I I would say. Um... There's no right or wrong, or the the only there's no one way to to do this CVC, right? I've seen um, our peer CVC started uh, uh, like us, uh, investing in the VC to enter into the ecosystem to learn the rule um, and. Part of the benefits that we get from the VC is that I could send my team uh, to um, do the secondment to to learn how to um, interview the startup, to learn how to do the due diligence. So they sort of uh, help us uh, solve a lot of problems to get us started. But at the same time, you start to see a lot of venture studio that would partner with the new CVC. Uh, help standing up the CVCs and 
those firms are very reputable as well. So I, I think there are several ways to um, standing up the um, CVC organization. Um, and uh, But so far, we are pretty happy with uh, investing in the um, uh, early stage uh, venture funds partner that we have. We really trust them and we really value the relationship with them. All right, uh, Michael, very briefly, I know you have to uh, drop. Uh, no, it, it, it's an interesting question, and certainly, you know, I think if you look at our slides uh, earlier, you know, we've all invested in Emerald, which is a, a very corporate-friendly venture capital firm that, is, you know, Tina mentioned, you know, you can second, and you can, and and they've been a tremendous help to to Caterpillar. You know, in the early stage, I, I think it has to be part of your strategy, right? I mean, in order to invest in early stage, you need to get somebody in your org or R and D organization you know, interest it and, and being willing to work with them in order to truly get the value. You know, we we did select a, a number of uh, venture firms to invest in, and one of them was an early stage. It has turned out really, really well for us. Uh, you know, I would say in general, early stage investing, you know, is, is difficult, right? I mean, and it's not for the weak of heart and and people with small teams, right? You have to look at a lot of companies. You have to provide a lot of management support. So I do believe, you know, looking at an early stage venture firm as a partner to your corporate process is, is you know, again, if you can get the right folks interested in your organization, uh, uh, a reasonable path, right? All right, and Bernhardt? Okay. I, I... I, I would say there is no right or wrong. I, I, I think when you start and, and, and fund, you need two main things. This is really uh, access to deal flow. Uh, you need uh, uh, venture capital expertise, and, and you need uh, to build up as quickly as possible reputation in the industry. And I think there are two ways to do this. One way really is to do a couple of LP uh, engagements. This is one way. The other way really is to, to hire some 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 experts from 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 the industry. I, I think there is a third way, and, and this is the third the way I would least recommend. And this is to really take some smart people out of your own organization and, and, and try to do all yourself. This is most likely to set up to fail. And, and I can give you a couple of examples for this. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, guys, for this uh, wonderful discussion panel today. Uh, thanks for sticking around for the uh, audience questions with me. I really, really appreciate your time and, and your patience. Um, uh, so thank you very, very much um, to our audience. Uh, stay tuned for our next webinar um, next, uh, next month, uh, which is going to be on the uh, quarterly data for the first quarter of 2020 and on the consumer sector. So stay tuned for that. Um, have a wonderful day, afternoon or evening, wherever you might be in the world. Goodbye. Be safe.